Time to hit that. There we go. Recording. Yep. Excellent. All let's right. start out by let's start out by saying that uh, we have before us a psalm that is pretty critical in both of our faith traditions, or pretty prominent. And that is when, if you're a part of my congregation, you hear the 23rd Psalm at any funeral that you might go to. It's a staple part of mourning liturgy and grief liturgy. It's a part of a, a set of psalms that people would say whenever they feel uh, collectively in danger. And it's become a stronghold, a staple of, of theology and faith in times of darkness. And I would imagine that uh, for many of the same reasons that it is such a staple piece of liturgy in the Jewish tradition, it's probably a staple piece of liturgy in the Christian tradition. Like you, I mean, our, our tradition, I would say about 90% of the people when we're planning a funeral service will ask for the 23rd Psalm to be done. Um, it, it harkens back to that, that whole thing of I'm going through a valley of the shadow of death and then taking, taking that whole thing and making that psalm as a very comforting psalm. Uh, and it is also part of our Sunday worship on the third, I believe it's the third Sunday after Easter called Good Shepherd Sunday, when that psalm will be used as part of our worship service during Easter time. Uh, so. And now I guess the question is, we've got 150 psalms. I'm going to say without a doubt, this one is probably the most well-known out of any of the psalms. It's probably one of the shorter psalms. It doesn't have any 117 profound... being the shortest. Yeah. Two verses. But it's not like Psalm 119, which is... I 150,000 like... verses. That, that is correct. It's, it's on the shorter side. It's poetic. Um, it doesn't have a profound theology. So the question is, why? Why do we have such a focus on this particular psalm? And maybe we'll ask you guys too. What do you what do you think makes this psalm so special? Mm -hmm. Twenty three is not some mystical number. I don't think in either of our traditions, by the way. No. No one. They're all going to wait. <laughs> what makes this psalm so special? Psalm twenty three: The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. I think that I have known it all my life and I have always found it comforting. And I know it by heart, at least in the King James Version. The comfort, I think that's an important word and an important thing. I think a shepherd is an iconic protector. Mm. Anybody else? Again, the shepherd leads us so that um, it's comforting to be led by someone who theoretically knows what they are doing. <laughs> <laughs> theoretically, of course. Uh, the shepherd I, I has the best interests of his, of his flock. I think that it's completely understandable. It's not confusing. As, as someone said, it is completely we all know it by heart, so it feels like part of our personal catechism before a time that we had a chance to disagree with something. And there's nothing in it to disagree with. Uh, so it had, one of the things to sum up what you're all saying is that it has a very simple theology and very relatable metaphors. The simple theology, if you were to sum up the psalm, I guess, would probably be God is with you when you're in a place of fear and God is comforting, period. And I would add and lead you through that fear to a better place. Yeah. I think what we've got to do, let's read the psalm. Maybe we'll read it a couple times with a couple different translations. Maybe I'll start in the Hebrew. You're going to share we'll go, going to share screen? I will share the screen with everybody. So let's start in the Hebrew so you can actually hear a little bit of the, the way that the psalm is meant to be uh, heard and the cadence of the psalm, even if you don't speak Hebrew. Then maybe we'll go into the message. 
And then maybe we'll go into King James and then Robert Alter, who's got a very scholarly translation of it. Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo exar, bin ot deshe yarvitseni al me menuchot yanachaleni, nafshi yeshovev, yancheni bamag le tzedek le man shemo, gam ki elech begeit salmavet lo ira ra, ki ata imadi, shiftecha o mishantecha heme yanachmuni, ta aroch le fanai shulchan neged surarai, di shanta beshemen roshi, tosi revaya. Achtov v'chesed yerdefuni kol yame chayai. V'shavti b'veit Adonai l'orech yamin. Dennis, the message. Okay, this is this this is more of a paraphrase than a translation. It was meant for Gen Xers, the Millennials, Gen Y, Z, B, whatever they are now, uh, to put it into modern day English. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chafe after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. And then good old King Jimmy. All right. How about you read this one and I'll read the, the last one. Okay, this, this is one that most people, when, you're, when we have a funeral service, a wake service, and we use this, everybody without a program knows exactly how to say this translation. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, and the last one is from a translator named Robert Alter. And by the way, let me just say quickly about translations, that all translations are to some degree interpretations. Uh, but we're going to do our best to understand it nonetheless. I don't want to be one of those snobby people who says, you can't really understand the text unless you know the original language. That's not really the case. You can understand the text and you can really learn a lot about it. Um, but it's important to remember that if you see it from a couple different translations, you might get a little bit of, uh, a little bit of nuance in the language and a little bit of insight. A, song, a David psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In grass meadows he makes me lie down. By quiet waters guides me. My life he brings back. He leads me on pathways of justice for his name's sake. Though I walk through the veil of death's shadow, I fear no harm, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, it is they that console me. You set out a table before me in the faces of my foes. You moisten my head with oil, my cup overflows. Let but goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long days. We're probably going to, I think, how many words are in this? In Hebrew, I think it's 54 words that are in this particular psalm, really short. And we're probably going to take this more or less line by line going through. Um, Dennis and I were saying that we probably could have taught two or three classes or maybe even more on just this psalm because it's so rich in the language, but we're going to do our best to get through it today. Just a quick reminder about the nature of the class. Previously, we had looked at uh, similar ideas within our religions and showed how our disparate texts uh, kind of come together and really a universal insight for our, our values that we share. 
this class, we're going to be looking at the same texts and we're going to be understanding them through the lenses of our different traditions. And you might hear things that are not necessarily Jewish if, uh, you know, we're learning from Dennis and not necessarily Christian if you're learning from me, but hopefully they'll inform each other and really give us insight and not just to one another's tradition, but into our own personal understandings of the text by understanding a little bit of an out of the box uh, interpretation that might not be shared by our own faith tradition. For me in one way that also gives, there's a, it adds to the richness of a, of a text. When, when you see how other traditions maybe approach it that we're not used to, but I think it fills, it fills in a, a broader picture. And to me, that, that shows God at work in some capacities. So the fr first thing I, we want to talk about, the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Shepherd. Well, where, how do we approach that term of shepherd? Uh, for those of us that are in... Okay, I got to go into the waiting room here. Admit. Okay, two more. Um, another one. <laughs> Let me also say I'm going to put a link to the text sheet that we are sharing on the screen. Yeah. On in in the chat, just in case you want to look at the actual link itself. So there are several passages in the Christian scriptures that talk to us about shepherd Jesus as shepherd. So right off the hand. Where we're obviously going to differ is when we talk about the Lord is my shepherd, in the Christian context, we're going to see that as Jesus uh, being that shepherd. So in Luke 15, verses 4 through 7, he's, he's in a debate with some of the Sanhedrin and the powers that be and says, well, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. I remember the, my very first trip over to Israel back in 78, way before Josh was born. And at what uh, was at the time the Continental Hotel up on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem, uh, that one morning I woke up and looked out my, of my window and that was, there were not, there were very few buildings up in that area at the time. And there was a shepherd and there were sheep there. And I saw one go bouncing off on its own. And I said, oh great, I'll get to see the good shepherd in action as the shepherd started walking off towards that sheep, leaving the rest of them together and goes off. And when he got to that sheep that had walked away, kicked it in the butt so that it got back to the flock, which gave me a whole new dimension <laughs> as to the concept of a good shepherd. Uh, but in one way, it's who's going to go after us when, we, when we're lost. The second one is from John 10, verse 11 and 13. I am the good shepherd, hence why we see the psalm in that context. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand's not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep, runs away. The wolf attacks the flock, scatters it. The man runs away because he's hired hand and cares nothing really for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not the sheep of that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Can we go down a little bit there, Josh? Um, then jumping to the uh, first letter of Peter, he has two brief references. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls, meaning Jesus. And in uh, 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. Then in our last book in the Christian Testament, the book of Revelation, <coughs> there's a duality going on here. There's the sheep that becomes the shepherd. Uh, this is at the very, this is, uh, for this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more uh, and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I hear in this echoes of Psalm 23. 
uh, in the book of Revelation, which is written after the year 100, by the way. Uh, so we're talking about fourth generation Christianity when this is uh, being written. Okay, Josh? I don't know what- Yeah, Dennis, I'm actually gonna borrow a little bit from your tradition, if that's okay. I don't know, let me I'm gonna, check it out, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the question of, you know, which aspect of God is a shepherd? I mean, I, I think uh, people often associate the quote unquote Old Testament God as being a vengeful, wrathful God who's angry, which isn't necessarily the case. God has many attributes in the Jewish tradition. In fact, one of the things that we say is, um, you know, God is rachum b'chanun erech apayim rab chesed le'emet. God is compassionate and merciful and extends kindness unto the thousandth generation. And we also see a God who's angry, of course. We also see a God who is a God of judgment. Um, but there's one aspect of God that, uh, that I, I think about a lot, and that is the God who actually has a feminine attribute. And it's in Hebrew called Shekhinah. Now, here's actually where our traditions are going to be quite parallel, I think, um, because I think Christianity has the concept or uses Mary in the way of, of comfort in a similar kind of way as, as Jews might use Shekhinah, God's comforting aspect. And I'm, I'm thinking in particular of one sculpture by, uh, by Michelangelo. It's the Pieta yeah. by Michelangelo. Yeah. I, I just wanted to bring it up on the screen so you can, you can see it. I'm going to have to stop sharing the text for a second. Dennis, you knew where I was going with this. We didn't well, talk about I mean, this. I, what, what I would caution is, is that the, the Mary image tends to be much more of a, a, a Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox tradition more than it would be any of the reformed uh, forms of Christianity. In the Episcopal tradition, what we're going to say is that Mary, indeed, she comes the first to believe that Jesus is who, we, uh, who he's foretold to be. She's the one that shows us how. But yet here, in, in many ways, in the 400, she's declared mother of God because Jesus is the son of God. And so all these churches get built in the name of Mary. Kind of interesting, I was having a discussion with someone who's online right now about this very thing or, or just two nights ago uh, without even contemplating that you were going to bring this up. But the Pieta by Michael, uh, uh, Michelangelo is, is clearly a way of how Christianity interprets Mary's role in, uh, in being the comforting side. We also have in Matthew, a, I don't remember the exact verse, but there is a verse where he says, God's love is like a hen brooding over her chick. Feminine version of that. Uh, we see the Ruach Yahweh, the breath of God, being feminine. Yeah, but interesting. Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the feminine side of God in our concept of the Trinity. In none of the Gospels does Mary ever hold Jesus like this. Am I correct? No, that's correct. And I and I believe that in the only assumption one of the is Gospels, that when Jesus is taken down from the cross, she because she's there, that he is put into her arms. But there's nothing that says that that happened. But what Michelangelo, so, I mean, going back to what Michelangelo, I think, is trying to express, he's trying to express this compassionate, divine mother that takes care of us in our times of ultimate distress and even death. And I'd say Judaism has that parallel, again, in what we would call the feminine aspect of God, the dwelling of God, um, Shekhinah. There's an interesting uh, thing we have um, a line in Hash Hashkivenu, one of our pieces of liturgy, we have uh, this line, shelter us beneath the shadow of your wings. And this is an idea of comforting, shelter, uh, protection that God offers us. That's shepherd, I think, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition. It's a specific aspect of God that gives us comfort in a time when we are in a period of most distress and danger and of course the world is an incredibly dangerous place especially or even more so in the biblical world uh, than it is today and that's even saying a lot given our current uh, state of the world but the shepherd is the ultimate comfort when danger lurks everywhere when there are wolves trying to attack the flock when the 
lamb goes astray or from whatever danger the flock might face. Tony. Because this is such an important part of our religions, how, Dennis, do you explain that this was written by King David, a Jew? Or don't you explain that at all? No, we, we understand clearly that, the song, that, that there are psalms written by David. There, remember, in early Christianity, the only scriptures we had were the Hebrew scriptures at the very beginning. Paul, yes, writes in the 40s, 50s, 60s, Till, he, till he's uh, martyred, but whenever after Christianity forms itself and gets a hold of itself in a, as an as its own, with its own identity, does it begin looking at these scriptures more clearly through the, with the, the rose-colored lenses of Jesus? So there's no question, we don't doubt that David wrote this, but we are interpreting the psalm to the context of, yeah, I mean, even David, the Lord is my shepherd. He's saying that his shepherd is God. Is that an I? And because these, that God's my shepherd, I'm never going to be in one, no matter where I'm going to be. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think that we can test at all the authorship, but we're going to look at this psalm differently maybe than uh, Judaism looks at it. I just want to comment on one word, and the word is, here you have to understand it, the Hebrew. Um, I guess one of the English ideas which gets stuck in the King James translation is, I shall not want. That means it's about materialism. But actually, the, the Hebrew is more, lo exar means, I don't lack anything. Right. And I think that's uh, an, an important idea of, of not lacking. I, I think it's the idea of, and maybe if I were to fill in here and put some, you know, what do they call brackets? It was the Lord of my, the Lord is my shepherd. And even though I might be in danger, even though I might be failing, and even though I might be dying, I still feel as if there's nothing that I actually lack in my life, or I don't lack God and I don't lack comfort. Um, there's nothing that's necessary that I really don't have. One of the ways maybe that I would tra not translate it because I don't know Hebrew at all, so I'm not even going to go there, but, but that I lack nothing aspect is in Christian tradition, several of these mystics keep talking about God's love is enough for me. I don't need anything. All I need is God's love. And in one way, that's how I would look at that. I lack nothing is, is that there's nothing that could substitute for being shepherded by the Lord. That there is, there is a sense of comfort. There's a sense of safety. There, there's a sense of fulfillment in who, in who the, uh, the Lord is, for, for however we want to interpret that. But that, that lacking nothing is that there's nothing that can be beyond. It's kind of, for me, and this is going to get into where we're going to be in later on as we look at this, but it's like I interpret the whole question of Adam and Eve eating the quote-unquote forbidden fruit is basically the temptation of the deceiver is God's love isn't enough for you. You really want to be equal to God. So go ahead. Eat the fruit of all the knowledge that there is. Eat it. Instead of acknowledging, reminder. I'm sorry? I was going to say it's a friendly reminder too that if, God is our shepherd, then who are we? We're, we're sheep. Right. And sheep Not very smart really... animals. Yeah. We we're very simple people and we don't lack, all, we don't need all that much other than uh, someone to protect us and uh, a, a nice green meadow in order to, mm -hmm. to flock. Josh and Dennis. Okay, Lynn. It's, uh, can somebody speak to whether the word shepherd in Hebrew is a masculine term only? Um, it can be both. Here it happens to be masculine. Is it always perceived as a masculine person? Because you said that there was an aspect of God that was feminine. Could be feminine. Yeah. Could be feminine. Yeah. Bernie's correct. It, it could be feminine, but here it's that the grammar is that it's masculine. But just to uh, remember the following that uh, in, if you know romantic language, just to kind of give you an idea of how Hebrew works. 
sometimes whether a noun or an idea is gendered has nothing to do with gender. <laughs> so for example, so for example, you know, um, in Hebrew, um, chalon is you know, window, it's feminine. What feminine attributes does a window have? Well, really none. I would it say just happens. it does. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's, it's arbitrary. A lot of the time it's arbitrary as to whether a certain word or noun is masculine or feminine. So I just want to point that out that the fact that it's a, a male shepherd grammatically doesn't mean that it's a male shepherd conceptually. Mm. In, in Latin, in Latin, um, the word for masculinity, virtus virtutis, is feminine. Yeah. <laughs> that's there a good. Go. That that's a really good. Uh, yeah. Point. Thank you. That's my father, by the way. He was also a rabbi. Hello, <laughs> Rabbi Franklin Senior. <laughs> Shall we move on? Yeah, where were we? We are on. You have control of this screen, kiddo. I can't. I okay. Bin ot deshe yarbitseni al me menuchot yenachaleni. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You know, so I, I have a question about that. Uh, because a lot of people oh, translated you. that the waters are still. I don't believe that at all. Which it's water? The place that's, it's the place that's quiet. It, because it, those two sentences are almost equivalent. Look at it in the Hebrew. Uh, being Ot Desha, so in in fields of grass, he makes me lie down. But actually, still waters is, is quite literally what it is because it's a construct ver, a construct noun, me menuchot. Uh, me are waters and menuchot are um, restfulness, uh, restful yeah, places. Look, then why didn't you do Yarbitani, Yenachalani are almost equivalent. They're talking Poetic. about, in my, opinion, in my opinion, they're talking about the place, not the waters. There's water where the still place is. Um, I think that's an interesting interpretation, but I think the way that uh, most people and most translators and scholars read it is that specifically the waters are still. And there's an important reason for that, which is how do you perceive water in general? The, the whole symbolism of water in both of our traditions. I yeah. Mean, uh, no, well, I don't believe that at all. Well, let's let's start with, if you go to the ocean, or if you want to go to the beach, you have two questions when you live in the Hamptons. Do I go to the ocean side or do I go to the bay side? If you go to the ocean side, the reason people want to go there is because there's waves and it's big. But you got to remember, when you go to the ocean side, the water is rough and the water is dangerous. And yeah, especially I'm, as for me, if you have kids, sure. it's uh, actually yeah, dangerous. I've been on the water, on the water, under the water. I know all about that. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if you go to the wilderness someplace or you go to a desert at someplace, the water is important. Of course. So let's start so with and go back it then. Around. Let then we have to actually analyze then, water as a whole. But what I'm saying is that the the contrast here between still I, water. And it implied that an, an implication that water might actually be pretty dangerous in the world should uh, you go to the wrong place. By the way, let's say you're in Egypt and you're in, ancient, let's, in Israel, you're an ancient Israelite and you go to the Nile. What's the problem? In addition, and we're not talking about the pollution back, the, back then. You're talking about crocodiles jumping out of the water and being in a very dangerous place. Yeah, and water, if, you go to the dentist, it, if you go to a desert, you can lie down and make sure there's water there. Well, let's, let's start with the implication that water is a double-edged sword. It could be dangerous or it could be life restoring. And I'm curious to know, I'm gonna to turn to Dennis. Dennis, what's your symbolism of water actually mean? Well, I mean, for, for in, the Christian, Christian, in the Christian concept, that, that whole thing of water is, is important because 
It, it can be salvation. It can be saving. It can be damning. I mean, all we have to do is think of flooding. Um, we look at uh, the waters are parted by Moses for people to get through. They become saving waters. You go to back to Noah, uh, they become destructive waters. Uh, in the um, Christian tradition, water, for some odd reason, and I think it's trying to play off of both the Noah and the Red Sea experience, water becomes a symbol for the church. So in our sacrament of baptism, in the early church, the um, baptismal fonts were very much like your ritual baths. Um, so, but there was a stairway to enter in on one side and a stairway to enter out. It might have been three, four stairs, but they were pools of water that were supposed to be living waters. In other words, they had to be, there had to be a stream flowing through it, but they were restful, they were calm. And in the early Christian community, you went in on one side, symbolizing your old life. You were baptized by immersion. And as you were baptized, the people were singing, what? Psalm 23. And you came out on the other side, back into life, back into new life. You've gone into the still waters and come out refreshed. Uh, the, also in um, biblical interpretation of some of the events in Jesus's life, especially from Matthew 8, when he has done his preaching on one side, gets into the boat, is pretty exhausted, goes to one end of the boat and falls sound asleep, and they go out onto the Sea of Galilee, and all of a sudden, as is wont to happen, uh, a, a big wind comes up, it gets stormy out on the Sea of Galilee, and then it, has, it says here, a windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. They went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we're perishing. He said, why are you afraid? You have little faith. He got up, rebuked the winds and said, quiet, be still. The wind died down and there was a dead calm. How that gets interpreted is, is that whenever the waters are stormy in the church life, there's some controversy going on. So when Matthew is writing, that community has just been officially thrown out of Judaism. And so they're afraid that they're going to sink. We're not going to be able to go on. Matthew uses this metaphor of the water for the church, and Jesus is still in charge of everything. So don't worry. Don't be afraid. It all will come out good in the end. So all of a sudden, the sea calms down. When we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the storm uh, subsides. Later on in Matthew, he'll come walking across kind of a choppy sea, and Peter will see him, and he'll be standing there. This is the infamous walking on water, and no, it wasn't below 32 degrees. Uh, and Peter says, oh, let me come out to you, Lord. When Peter's faith shakes, he sinks. When he believes that Jesus can pull him through this as the shepherd, pulling him through it, he is all right and can walk to the Lord. So the water becomes a symbol of the faith of the church and whether or not we can really pull through without sinking ourselves and that the choppiness or the restfulness when the waters are calm means the church is, is safe we have a little bit different of a metaphor shock. for water in judaism yeah what a, what a what a shock uh water seems to be a giant metaphor throughout the entire hebrew bible for torah for learning or for sacred uh, scripture so you see in, in a number of places, water is also co goes with a different, uh, different description. Instead of still waters, water is often called Maim Chaim. And Maim Chaim in Hebrew means living waters. Um, in, in fact, we have a ritual that's parallel to, uh, to baptism. That's where baptism originated right. called mikvah. Right. And mikvah is the immersion in ritual waters that are supposed to be a transformative experience that literally transforms the individual. So when you're by still waters, you're, I mean, it could be essentially by living waters, waters that will literally do what we're going to learn in the next verse that will restore you. Yeah, but and not just, and not just restore you. You with, keep physically. looking at the, at the word water and, and messing around with water. I look at the, 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 the line before that, Yabitzani and Achaluni, it's one for one. It's the place that's quiet and Bernie, there's water there. Bernie, okay. I'm just going to say grammatically, I think you're misreading it. The, the implication of the grammar is clearly 
that the waters are still, not that the place is still. So let, let so me, I, let I, let I me encourage you to look at it again. Here, Josh. I, I, Bernie, I really appreciate that because I, I do think that there is a concept of if the pasture is a restful place, then the water that's at that pasture is also going to be life-giving. Um, so I think the image, I mean, I don't know Hebrew, so I'm not going to argue the grammar there, but I think the place is a restful place, the green pastures. Just the fact that they go out of their way Absolutely. to say green is a matter of it's life-giving. And that obviously the water has nourished that grass. And so whether it is a restful waters, restful pasture, I think the image still holds that it becomes a place where life is given, where rest is, is possible. And I, I think it's actually a metaphor for a lot more. And I think it's primordial. I think that if you understand that we as humans are born by a woman out of water and that all of this mm -hmm. is actually a metaphor, including born again, including baptism, including the origins of human, the miracle of God. We're born out of woman, out of water. Hmm. Yep. Very nice. Let me let me go back to this concept of water as a metaphor for Torah in the Jewish tradition. We have this great uh, piece of interpretive uh, literature called Midrash. Midrash literally means interpretation, and it's going to liken and give this metaphor as to how Torah and water are related. Words of Torah can be compared to water, wine, oil, honey, and milk. To water, oh, who let all who thirst uh, come for water, from Isaiah 51. Just as water goes out from one end of the earth to the other, as it is written, to the, others, to the other spread forth the earth above the waters, so too does Torah go from one end of the earth to the other. I'll skip the, the biblical proof text here. Just as water is forever living, uh, so too is Torah forever living. And just as water comes from heaven, so too does Torah come from the heavens. Just as water has many voices, so too does Torah have many voices. Just as water restores the soul, so too does Torah restore the soul. And by the way, if you're looking for the link to restoring the soul, what's the next line of the psalm? The next line of the soul. psalm is... God restores my, my soul. Or you might actually say, um, it's not necessarily God who's doing the restoring here. It could, in fact, be the water being restorative to the soul. Um, but I actually, I actually think it works in both contexts of Jewish and Christian. The church restores your soul, or, or at least uh, the calm waters of the church restore your soul or the calm waters of Torah restore your soul as well. Yes, Tony. Josh, water is also purification. Right. Yes, that, and look, the, the metaphor is gonna extend really far because water works on so many different levels as a metaphor. Um, as one of my uh, professors from rabbinical school used to say, he says, every metaphor is kind of like a Venn diagram. Water does this and Torah does this and they're close together. Water doesn't do everything that Torah does, but actually the overlap is really significant. And that's what makes the metaphor actually strong and good. But calm water in particular as the metaphor here. Well, well, okay. <laughs> Look, you know, my guiding star is uh, he. Which, in case you're from a different faith tradition, Bernie is quoting a piece of Talmud. That means, uh, essentially, when there's an argument uh, about scripture, one of the rabbis calls out, you know what? He's quoting scripture here. He's saying, Lo he, even though heaven might disagree with me, it's actually up to us to interpret the texts that we have. That's Bernie's favorite line. Love All it. right, let's let's move I'll on. Just to one more thing on the water aspect, go Josh. Go back a little bit to John. In uh, in our tradition, in the Passion, actually in John uh, uh, John's Gospel, it's not chapter seven; it's twenty-seven. Um, 
one of the soldiers, uh, when Jesus is near death, pierces his side um, with a spear. All of a sudden, John reflects that there's a flow of blood and water. Uh, the man who saw it given testimony, his testimony is true. For us, the blood and the water symbolize both baptism and Eucharist. Uh, so uh, that is a saving water for us. Uh, and that's what restores our soul, which leads into uh, this next section. Maybe we want to go and skip a little bit. Okay. If you were to put uh, Psalm 23 in three paragraphs, it would probably be the first paragraph about the still waters or the still place, the peaceful place, and God leading you as the shepherd. And then we go into just one line, which has become a very um, paradigmatic line. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. A lot is in that line. So let's skip there because I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time to talk about it. Oh, just one. Uh, uh -huh, I do want to talk. I do want to, I do want to talk about the Maglade Sedek, the, the righteous paths. Uh, give me one, two minutes. We're going to talk about it. Who knows in Hebrew what the word, the Hebrew is Yancheni uh, B'Ma'aglet Sedek, which means you lead me in, well, let's ask with the question, what is a Ma'agel in Hebrew? Translated as path here. Anyone know what a Ma'agel is? It's actually a circle, which is a little bit hard to understand. What the paths that are going on here, it's seemingly... God leads me in big winding paths that loop around. And those big winding paths, you have to remember, are probably not the easiest paths to go down. They're the long road. It reminds me of this story, which I wanted to share with you about uh, from the Talmud. I'll read it to you. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananiah asked a young man sitting at a crossroad, which way is the way to the town? The young man pointed to one of the paths and said, this is the short but long. The other way is the long but short. Rabbi Yehoshua, or Rabbi uh, ben Hanania set out on the first path. That is, he set out on the short but long. Uh, quickly, he arrived, uh, he set out on the first path, quickly arrived at the town, but found his way was blocked by gardens and orchards. He then returned to the young man and said, didn't you tell me that this path was short? I did, said the young man, but I also warned you that it was long. Better to take the long road that eventually gets you to your destination than the short road that doesn't even, uh, the, the short one that doesn't even though it does, even though it looks as it does. Maglet Sedek are seemingly the really long, windy paths that are the right road to go down that will get you to your destination, even though there's seemingly a shorter road ahead that won't get you there necessarily. And I often think about that uh, in terms of the righteous path is quite often the more difficult path to go down, but it's the only road that will actually get you there. That word, ma'agel, is such a critical thing that doesn't get translated. I felt like I just had to point out the fact that righteous paths are not the easy paths. Righteous paths are the long winding paths that bring us around and around and around. Thank you for letting me go off on that tangent. You're welcome. Dennis, I'm gonna let you get the first word though on walking through the valley of the shadow of death. There, I mean, there's a couple of things that um, I, mean, I walk through. The darkest valley is one of the ways that it can also, that one of our translations has, but the most common one is the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, again, with that first trip to Israel, when the, before the super highways were built, I remember our tour guide uh, when we had gone from Jerusalem to Jericho, and then we're going back up to Jerusalem from Jericho uh, along a very steep uh, valley and sheer cliffs um, and 
with the tour guide had said, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I loved it because it helped me to understand this little portion a little bit. He said, this used to be known as the Valley of Death. Death, our, the, the Israeli Death Valley, kind of, kind of punning off of ours. So because way back when, it was the shortest route up to Jerusalem, but it was the most dangerous route to Jerusalem. It had lots of caves, lots of hideouts for bandits, and you were really literally taking your life in your hand when you were walking up that, uh, through that, that pathway. So he said, it indeed was the valley of death. And so the Lord will walk with me through that valley of death. He will keep me safe in that. I'll, there's no, nothing that's going to harm me. That helped me in that, that capacity. However, though I walk through the darkest valley, uh, I fear no evil. I'm going to go through the whole thing. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. E in most Near Eastern traditions, kings were seen as shepherds. Their mace, their rod of office, and they were given a staff, a, cro a shepherd's crook. Um, um, that the um, concept um, at the time, in ancient, the ancient Near Eastern uh, concepts, uh, was that as shepherds, they were to lead you in no matter what time of the, uh, of the history there was. With the darkest periods, they were meant to get you through it safely as your leader. Uh, and they're actually pictured with uh, a rod, a staff, and a staff, and a, and a, um, they call a mace, a rod. Um, for us, that darkest valley uh, speaks of the dark night of the soul, as John of the Cross would have put it that even though I'm walking through the darkest moments of my life, even though things just don't seem to be coming together, there's, there still is within me that God is enough for me. I'm not gonna fear this, this evil. Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, when her spiritual biography came out, shocked a lot of people. Here she was, a very holy woman who took care of so many people and did so many things and would talk and preach and do all sorts of wonderful things for people, admitted in there, that there was a period in her life where she didn't even know if God existed. That things were getting so depressing for her. And what she saw day in and day out in Calcutta one, made her wonder whether or not God was even in existence and if God really cared. But she said it was this passage that kept her going on. That even though I'm in this darkest moment of my life, in this moment of depression, in this moment of, I don't know what it's all worth, I'm not going to fear it because somehow I know that you're with me, that you'll lead me through it. I don't know when I'll get through it, but I know I will be led through it. And for us in the Christian context, that's exactly what this is about. There's that, um, it, it was a poster, but it's called uh, Footsteps in the Sand. Um, and it always starts off with two sets of footprints in the beach, uh, beach sand. And then all of a sudden there's one set of footprints and the thing. So, you know, I, I know that you were with me through this part, but then, then you left me alone. There's only one there. And, and God says, that's when I carried you through the dark moments of your life. Um, as kind of highlighting this passage right there. Um, so that's kind of where we come from on the Christian context in, in verse four. Now this one line and I know for you are for for, five minutes on it. No, it's fine. For you are with me, I think is incredibly important. Uh -huh. uh, and, and it goes back to why I think this psalm is so popular. Um, in Hebrew, ki ata imadi means for you are with me. I mean, very simple translation. But it could say something else, right? And, and if you look at most psalms, you probably expect to read, even when I walk in and I face my foes and I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you will save me. You will redeem me. You will bring me out. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying simply, you are with me. And the idea of presence and comfort, I think, is so incredibly important here um, for Emmanuel. understanding what's going on. Emmanuel. Yeah. God is, or you are with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll give you my translation of the Hebrew. Even though I walk through the valley of Salmavet. Salmavet is a very interesting word, and I'll tell you what the King James translation did with it. 
Salmavet probably means deep darkness. It's used in other contexts to mean that. But the King James translation took it to mean two different words that were a construct of a word. So it's cell in Hebrew, if you were to put a space between them, is a shadow, and mavet is death. And that's how it got shadow oh, death. of death. Um, but what I think is going on, where if you go to deepest darkness, you get a sense that uh, it should remind you of, of certain other areas of the Bible that talk about deep darkness. And the deepest darkness that was known in the Bible is the ninth plague. And I think the ninth plague gives you a little insight as to what kind of darkness we are actually looking at. So Exodus 10, Moses holds out his arm towards the sky uh, and thick darkness descended on all the land for three days. So a thick darkness descends. And here's what we learn about the darkness. Um, oh, it's not... Uh, we're, we're missing a one verse here that talks about the darkness was so thick that you could touch it, that you could feel it. So you know that darkness is the absence of light in terms of the sense in physics. But here, it's a darkness that can be felt. And it's so thick that a person could not see another or people could not see one another for three days. And no one could get up from where they were for three days. It's incredibly important to realize if you're in that kind of darkness, what don't you have? You don't have someone who is with you. When you're in a spiritual darkness, the idea of another person being around you is incredibly comforting. I wanted to um, bring up a, a quote or a piece from um, Howard, uh, Harold Kushner's book. The book is called The Lord is My Shepherd. He says, some years ago, a professor of psychology at a major university conducted an experiment in pain tolerance. Mm -hmm. He invited several dozen students to measure how long they could keep a bare foot immersed in a bucket of, ice, of ice water. If we, if we could uh, just mute our backgrounds, if you have a dog there and uh, unmute right. when you're speaking, that would be helpful. Uh, one, one of the things he learned was that if there was someone else in the room a person could keep his foot in the bucket nearly twice as long. The presence of another caring person doubles the amount of pain someone can endure. Guilt feels less deserved. Pain is less painful. Misfortune is less oppressive when someone is there with you. In other words, when you're in Salmavet, when you're in this deep darkness, or you're in this plague of darkness that is a spiritual darkness that you can literally feel the only way to get through it is to have the presence of someone else now if you are in a place in your life where no one else is around you still have presence so long as you believe and you feel the presence of god yes. with you yeah. and i think that's that's I think why that one line resonates so profoundly throughout our traditions. Tony, I, I saw your hand. I think up. that's where Mother oh. Teresa was coming from. Is that she? She said, "I even though I questioned the existence. I knew that that God was still with me. Yes, so before, she was able to get said, through it and bear it." Tony, I was going to say God, but you you said it before I did. Sorry, but you're never alone if God is with you. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, and, and by the way, you know, an interesting thing, I, um, I put a couple verses from Job up here. I'm teaching a class on Job, and Job has this whole chapter where he talks about the deepest darkness that he could possibly be in, and he uses five different words for darkness in this particular section. Darkness, murkiness, gloom, deep gloom, obscurity, night, all over and over again to give you the sense that the place he's in in his life is just so utterly dark. But the interesting thing about Job is that what he feels in his life, he has three friends who are supposed to comfort him and they don't. And the person who comforts him or is supposed to comfort him, God, he feels abandoned by. And I think Job's struggle, at least in this chapter, is all about how you actually manage darkness when you have no presence, no God to be along there with you. Job is 
I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death or I'm walking through the valley of deep darkness and no one's here with me. And that is a very distressing thought. Before we move on, any questions, any comments? Just a reminder, you can feel free to ask anything and don't be afraid. Not because we are with you, but don't be afraid because it's good to ask questions. We have our rod and our staff with us. Let's go to what that means. Your rod and your staff are, are with you. I mean, that's uh, it's gotta be a metaphor for something, Dennis. You think? <laughs> What do you, what is, what is Christianity interpreted as? Let me go back up to the translation. So they, they basically look at that as the, um, as the shepherd's crook, the shepherd's staff with the uh, curvature on it. In fact, in our, uh, in our liturgical tradition, our bishops, our overseers, our episcopoi, carry the shepherd's crook as a reminder that they're always walking with us and leading us, leading us through. And technically, it's if you if you go astray, they can reach down and crook your neck and bring you back in. Uh, on in the theater, we used to use that to get a bad act off the stage. Just quickly reach out and yank them off. But in in uh, in the reality, it's it's the the shepherd is able to guide the flock better with that by tapping them in back in, inside the flock. Um, May I ask a question? Sure, Diane. Uh, well, it just seems to me, I'm not sure this is a question, but uh, that when times when I am allowed, let's say, or walk through dark times, those are the times that I actually become much closer to God because I recognize how much I need him. Uh, and other times you're busy and everything's going well, and so you don't. So I think sometimes we are led into these paths of darkness in order to feel his presence and to remind us of his presence. And, and Right. And, and I think this pandemic that we've just gone through, I mean, that's a good question that everyone really can look at is how maybe this psalm has helped you get through these last six, seven months. But your rod and your staff, they, counsel, they console me, is also, I think, a wonderful metaphor for, for me anyways, of the word. Uh, the scriptural word uh, might be the Torah for you, but uh, for us as a scriptural word, they, 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 uh, many times they console me uh, when, I, when I look through them. And it's, 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 a, it's a guide, a rod and a staff help guide, so they become a guide for me as well. Go ahead, Tony. Are they also signs of authority? Yes. I would actually take that one step oh, further oh, and to say, yeah, I take it one step further and say that a shepherd also uses his rod in order to fend off wild animals. Right. It's a weapon. Yeah. You know, you might say that uh, it, although it's not as clear, um, the rod is the double-edged sword. I mean, the, the metaphor doesn't work if you were to say a double-edged sword, but uh, a staff, as, as Dennis pointed out, is what you literally use to guide the sheep. And it's at the same time, the thing that you use to fend off enemies and fend off wild beasts. But the, the psalmist here is gonna to choose to see it as something of comfort and not something of war. Well, it's-, it's If it's, they're I also symbols of authority, they're also symbols of legitimization. Right. And like I said, most kings, even they're referred to throughout scriptures, even as, as shepherds of the people of Israel. But when they're pictured, they're pictured with a mace, the rod, and a staff, the shepherd's crook. Those get, those get uh, dwindled down in some iconography. Um, you, if you kind of rem remember the pictures of the Pharaoh, small crooked, a small crooked handle on one side and a mace with um, uh, beating and hair, or uh, I don't know what you'd call them, strands of, of things coming down. It was, it was a multi-layered whip. So in some ways, it's both the rod and the staff. I'm here to protect and also to guide. 
Um, Just wanted to say one. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to share one more story from Harold Kushner's book, but I want you to finish your thought. That was it. <laughs> okay. Um, here's you an out there. Me, so my thought disappeared. <laughs> maybe it'll come back. Here's an out there thought about, uh, about what the staff is. And maybe it's just reading it a little bit in the English language. By the way, ha Harold Kushner is a rabbi who he wrote the book, um, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Yeah. It's essentially a book about uh, his own personal experience, losing his child to a, a rare genetic disease at a very young age. And uh, he writes a book essentially on the 23rd Psalm, which is personally meaningful for him. And he talks about the rod and the, your staff. He says, I had just completed uh, the graveside uh, funeral service for the elderly mother of a congregant. When a man came up to me, identified himself as a friend of the man whose mother had died and said, when I listened to you recite the 23rd Psalm at the graveside, I finally understood one line that I never understood before. It's about thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I never knew that the, that meant what that meant before, but now I think I get it. I'm a businessman, he went on. If I have a problem with one of my suppliers, I call the president of the company to straighten things out. But I usually don't get to talk to the president of the company I usually end up speaking to a member of his staff who tries to make me feel better. I think that's what the psalm is saying. When people on earth have problems, they call out to God. God doesn't intervene himself. He sends a member of his staff to do the comforting. I see you as a part of God's team, sent to comfort people and make them feel better when they are hurting. I just thought that was very profound essentially god going back to you are with me you're with me but you don't intervene necessarily on my behalf to protect me just knowing that your present is comforting and in fact your staff is all of you who are meant to do the comforting as we are the extension of god's own hand that metaphor for me i, I don't know that that struck me as, as very profound All right. I, I've got one more, I think, important question. I don't think we discussed this one, Dennis, but the last line, maybe we'll go out, a little out of order. Um, the last line is um, really the last line. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for many long years, or I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My question is, and maybe this is a question for everybody, where is the house of God? On Park Avenue. <laughs> where is the house of God? And think if you're the psalmist in particular, where is the house of God? I have an answer. Diane, did you have an answer? Well, I, my, my father used to consider death as graduation. And uh, my, I think that we see reality with five senses, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, it could be right where we are, but we simply can't perceive it. But mm -hmm. so many people have had near-death experiences who come back and talk about it, and it's very similar. So my idea of the house of God is when we die, we are, we are then alive with more senses. It's beautiful. Marjorie. Yeah, Marjorie. So my sense that what came to me was where I am dwelling, how I am in my heart and my soul, and where my peace is at the time. Not necessarily a place, but a spirit, a sense of spiritual well-being. So I dwell mm -hmm. with the Lord. He is with me always. Again, back to what Dennis said, you know, beside me, carrying me, and it gives me a sense of peace. I like that idea because the whole psalm is about uh, lack of man-built, man-made space. It's all about 
wherever you are in nature or by the waters. So essentially turning inwardly is certainly um, a place where we can find God's house. I love that. Beautiful. Can you just briefly explain, you spread a table for me in full view of my enemies and what your interpretation of that is? If we have time, we'll go back. I'm glad I made you laugh, Dennis. We had our own little discussion about that one. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you that it's, it's pro I'll, I'll tell you the, the scholarly aspect uh, of this one, which is that it's probably a corruption of the text that uh, you're not, what does it mean to be a table? But you spread a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Um, it probably means um, a shelach in Hebrew is another word for a bow. And here it's shulchan, a table. And probably what it was is you spread out or you draw a bow before me in the presence of my enemies. And it's a, it's a military metaphor. I mean, that's probably what the original text said it's we i can go into the whole theological implications of uh of a table but i don't know i kind of i think of it like that can i ask a question i said yeah yeah um i am questioning i don't understand this is the first time that i have seen the idea that this relationship this wonderful relationship will in two of these places it's all the days of my life does that mean while i am an alive human being a mortal human being and then it says many long years whereas you know the one that most of us have said is forever and i'll give you the i can give you the I most literal to, translation said, Right. I mean, most but literal what trans do you feel? Yeah. The most literal translation means for the length of my days. Okay. So it's or actually not, it's, it's not it's even until I die. Is that the sense? Let me actually you know what I mistranslated it uh, again. So it's actually not for not for the length of my days, but it's for the length of days. Ah, okay. And therefore you can really interpret it as <clears throat> either physical life or, you know, life everlasting or right. afterlife. It really does, it's ambiguous enough that you can probably go any which way with that. Right. right. Yeah. I didn't think it was term life insurance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to the question, where is the house of God? And the reason I'll ask you this question, I think is that I think what the psalmist is looking for is where he can dwell in the house of God, or where is it that you actually find the house of God? And if you answer that question, if you're able to answer that question personally, I think you have uh, really spiritually internalized the message of the Psalms. Yep. Oh, hold on. I uh, just want to unmute you. Someone is trying to speak and I'm trying to unmute. Hey, no. Uh, is that Lynn? It's Lynn. Hi. Right. Yeah. Is it that quiet place of Bernie's? I think that's certainly part of it. I mean, look, if you look at the very beginning of the psalm, seemingly God's house is the, the still waters, the righteous path, the green pastures. It's everywhere outside. Um, this is an interesting thing, which I realized the other day. Um, there used to be a study that if you go to a hospital, used to be think that if you paint the walls white, it'll give the impression of health. Or sorry, not of health, of, uh, of cleanness, Sterility. right? Now, what color do they paint hospital walls? Blue. Blue, light blue and light oh, green. Oh, green. Yeah. Why? Calm. Because they're actually, because they're calming colors. They want yeah. to paint them calming colors. Now, the interesting yeah. thing about yeah. the world in which we live is that if you look outside, and you see the water, it's blue, it's calming. You look at the sky, it's blue, it's calming. The fields, the green pastures, green, it's calming. The same colors that they use to paint hospitals because they're calming colors. They're not bright and in your face. They're not red, they're not uh, orange. They're, they're the calming colors. And I think God's place that he's leading us to here, God's house is the place where we feel spiritually calm 
and attuned to the world around us and attuned to ourselves. Tony. If we are all of, if we are all God's creatures, then God is wherever we are. Hmm. Dennis, I want to know what you think. <clears throat> Sorry. Go, <clears throat> go ahead. I want to know what you think of what it's referring to with God's house. <clears throat> I, I mean, people want to automatically say it's like a temple, a synagogue, a church. If, from the script, from the mystical and spiritual tradition of the church, the house of the Lord is always seen as the soul and the heart, uh, the center of one's being. That I, I, you know, I've come to dwell within you. Hmm. And so the house of the Lord is us. We're, um, Paul will talk about we're the temple of God, uh, not, not the physical place, but we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God, if we say that God dwells within us, then I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my, my whole, all the day, all, for, for all days. I'm saying that in some way I've become that house because of God's spirit that's within me and dwelling in that house is dwelling in that spirit or I, I like to, to go back to uh, that whole thing of the ruach, the, the breath of God. As long as I breathe in God's presence, I am the house of the Lord. Um, I shared a couple of years ago, uh, James Weldon Johnson, uh, who is a black uh, poet uh, in uh, the early 20s, he did a series of uh, poems called God's Trombone. And it was taking seven Bible stories and rendering them in some just wonderful, wonderful language. And in the story of creation, at the very end of the, of the poem, when God is creating humankind, he goes, and there the great God Almighty, like a mammy bending over her baby, blew into it the breath of life and humans became a living soul. That, that image of a mammy bending over her baby and blowing life into that baby, that for me becomes the house of the Lord at that moment. Um, it's the ruach, the spirit that enlivens us. Um, and as, as long as I dwell in that spirit, I'm in the house of the Lord. Wow, beautiful. Dennis, I think we're running low on time. You think? So maybe, yeah, so let's, uh, we recognize- We that would never do that, called, that. There's such thing called Zoom fatigue, and uh, we wanna make sure that we can not exceed an hour and 15 minutes. Right. But Any maybe other, let's wrap- Any questions or insights that people might wanna quickly share? And Dennis and Josh, just one thought about my cup runneth over. Oh, you get the I can't believe we skipped that. Well, it, to me, that's a very powerful way of going back to the beginning. I shall want for nothing, and my cup runneth over, you know, how fortunate we are. And it's so totally different from walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, it's, it's a, it sort of brings you full cycle from being scared and needing comfort and needing a rod to my cup is running over. And I don't know. That was just a thought I had when I got to the well, end well, of this. I, I think part of that is when we've done all of that, it forces us, when we come out of that darkness, it forces us to look at the blessings we have. It's also and, the cup. We too often don't do that. We don't, you know, I, I, often, I often chastise in the congregations. I, we, we always say, I want, I need to God. But we rarely say, I thank you, God. Uh, the, the prayer of Thanksgiving is very rare. And it's because we don't look at the cup as full or overflowing. We look at it as half empty or almost empty. And... And I don't know where part of the psyche that comes from, but you anoint my head with oil as a priestly type of thing, and my cup overflows as I all of a sudden I realize it's a lot better than I, I thought it was when I went into this. It really is a lot better now that I've been in that restful place, now that I've had the still waters, now that I realize that you're with me all the days of my life. Gosh, my, I have so many blessings. Let me just remind us too that if you have a white tablecloth and you're pouring wine and your cup runs over, one of two things is gonna happen. You're either gonna say, oh my goodness, I stained my tablecloth, my cup is overflowing. And it's, you're too overwhelmed 
and you're seeing the cup running over is making a giant mess. And I think the challenge is, is how do you take an overflowing cup and see it as abundance and blessing? Mm -hmm. And too often, I mean, it's easy. The, the context tells you that a cup running over is a good thing to see. But I think the world around us in general, we mostly actually see the cup running over as making a giant mess. And we have to yeah. just take a step back and say, wow, what blessing and what excess we have. Diane, real quick. Wait a minute, got on, you got to unmute yourself. Press the space bar. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Diane. Am I on? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, well, when you, when you, as you said, Dennis, when you realize all of the blessings, basically the love of God, and you, you are turned from worrying about yourself, and you begin to feel mm. love pouring out of you. And perhaps your cup running over is that love of God that pours out of you onto everything around you. Good. Yep. Yep. Okay. Anybody else real quick? Can you please have another class? Because the classes with the two of you are absolutely wonderful and informative and enlightening. Thank oh, you, Tony. Please. Well, thank you. Tune we in next, next week. week. Well, I echo that. <laughs> Is there, is there supposed to be a class next week? Because yeah. I thought yeah. there were only two. No, no there, there's, there's uh, six in total. There's going to be one week that we that we won't be on on a Friday because I am doing a family wedding up in New Hampshire. Okay, so do we know what next week is, or you'll email us? Uh, next week is about original sin and the garden. And sin oh, in general. God. That, that'll turn them off. They won't, they won't come back after that. Uh, and the week after that is the off week, but then we'll be picking up the week following. So take care, everybody. God bless. Shabbat, Shabbat, Shabbat shalom. shalom. Thank everybody. you, Josh. Thank, Thank you, Dennis. Dennis. You're welcome. Bye. Shabbat shalom. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell this story about